What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access, and today we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Lord Finesse. Thank you for coming through, sir. Uh, salute, 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 man. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, man, it's been a, a, a long time, because when uh, the only real time I interviewed you was for The Awakening back in the day, so it's been a minute. Man, talking about, like, that's like 25 20, years. Yeah, 25 years, so I'm glad we could uh, finally reconnect. And then I actually got you in my book, The History of Gangster Rap. I took a picture of you in exhibit that I used uh, when one time we were all on Sunset. So that okay. worked out well. Because I did shout you out for the message. But we'll get to all that. Um, okay. So right now, uh, Lord Finesse just put out recently the Motown State of Mind, where he remixed and reimagined some uh, classic records. So um, I wanted to get... How was the process for you of selecting the songs that you uh, decided to, to tackle? Well, I think the, the way I selected the songs, there were a lot of childhood favorites, you know, from I Want to Be Where You Are um, to uh, Switch. Man, you know, people sleep on that record, Switch. They'll never be. That record always had a good feel. It was just like a ballad. That would come on 1 a.m. or something, you know, you touch it on WBLS or something. So to <clears throat> actually, you know, be able to to speed that record up and touch it, and of course, I like it. And you know, um, Marvin Gaye, I want you. I mean, all these records was favorite records, all the way down to Sisters Love. Sisters Love was more of a personal record because um, if you ever watched the Mac when they doing the player's ball, you know, they would, when they pull up, you got Sisters Love on stage and they're performing. I mean, the sound wasn't the greatest, <clears throat> but the energy of the record was dope. So that was one of the peculiar requests that I asked when I asked um, Motown, like, you know, for, when I asked them for that session, they had no idea why I asked them for that session or what I was going to do. Like I said, it was a favorite of mine, and it was it was a song that was in a movie but was never on the soundtrack. So I definitely wanted to bring back that nostalgia. And plus, people who know the Mac movie very well know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so to bring that back to life and do what I did with it and got an instrumental available on a box set, I just think it's, it's a nice collector's piece. And with the Mac in particular, of course, with a lot of elements in a movie with the pimping and stuff, what that's more, I'd say, synonymous with maybe Oakland or the West Coast or something. What was it about that made that really appeal to you in a certain way? It was the bass line. It was, it was just the energy, how they were singing it, the chorus. That song had energy. It just felt now was the time. It had a Black exploitation feel. And even now what we're going through with the protests and the COVID, and I mean, now is the time, you know, on so many levels. Now is the time, one, get our shit together. Now is the time if you're in a house and you've been trapped in a house since March, if you don't come out of this with no type of vision or idea, it's just waste of time. You might as well just give up, you know? Right. I agree. Well, I thought uh, you mentioned the Marvin Gaye with I Want You, and uh, the thing that I thought was interesting was that's um, one of his lyrically a very uh, somber, I guess, uh, look at love or desire in a way. Um, so for you constructing uh, the way that you redid it, how did you look at the lyrics and what he was saying to kind of merge the sonics of what you were going to be doing. Right. I mean, um, with the Marvin Gaye, that, that plan was already in place, you know, due to the fact that um, I kind of took that earlier and, and flipped it around and, and resequenced it. Yo, Lynch. Interview. <laughs> Sorry. Good. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of in pocket already. 
you know? So uh, only thing I wanted to do was kind of EQ it and use elements that people didn't use before, bring out certain things in a song that people didn't hear before and kind of resequence it and then gave it an intro with the, with the chorus harmonies to open the song up, I thought it was real good. It gave it a it gave it a nice groove, a nice feel. And with um, with that, using different elements and different things, with sampling and being a producer as well, how how did you approach it uh, creatively and sonically? Looking at this remixing, and how have you always done that versus actually producing, especially when you're sampling? Well, this remix, um, it was just bringing a different energy, a different vibe to these songs. So it depends on which song. Each song had a different approach. Like, well, when I, well, I want to be where you are, I think we replayed a Fender Rose and my boy Young World put a solo in the, in the, in the break of the record. You know, um, would I like it? That was, I think, the most challenging and complicated one because anybody that knows that record by the bars know that that bass line, that groove is very dominant. And when you think of that record, you think of the horn. You know, you thinking about the whole groove. So for me to touch it and um, put a whole nother melodic vibe to it, that makes you think of, that makes you kind of forget about the original groove was, I felt great, that I felt great about that. Cause if you listen to it and you never heard the bars, you'll think that was the original, you know? Cause it feels that good. Yeah, and I think that one too, I think it, speaking of the feel of it, uh, your version or reimagination of it, I think is the one, one of the ones I would say that has the most dramatic difference from the original record. Right. So. So sonically and structurally, what made you want to make such a dramatic change? Because I feel with R and B, if you're gonna do something to it, try to if you're gonna give it a different vibe, I'm I'm big on melodies, I'm big on chords. And I think when you listen to R and B music, if you can't predict the direction or the vision that the producer is doing when it comes on, I think that's that's the whole surprise of it all is when it comes on and the chords come in and they start taking you on the vibe or taking you on the trip and you're trying to figure out like, where is this going? And the groove is just solid. I mean, the vibe on on I Like It, ah, uh, man. When we was doing it and I was hearing those keys and those chords and the change up, it's like, like two change ups after the original breakthrough and then to take, um to take the vocals that nobody never heard before and open the song up with it, open the song up with a roll and a break and then go into the groove. I thought, thought that was nice. I thought that I, I was very impressed with that with myself. Like, oh, this is going to be dope. Yeah. And I think it does, you know, I think that what you did works throughout the whole project, but I do think I like it was probably my favorite because it's the most uh, dramatic difference of, at least to me, of the original versus what you did. And I think that shows, um, you know, your talent of what you were doing with the project, which leads me to, to wonder with, uh, as you're well aware with rap, a lot of times people had criticized it because there is no melody, there is no chords, um, other than unless they bring in a sample sometimes. And that's takes over as the melody or what have you. So for you, as a producer, as a musician, as somebody that's making music, how have you learned or navigated that you don't always need melody, but using melody? I always go by feel. I don't really figure out it, it, how it feels to me at the end of the day is the greatest thing that I, I look at. I don't worry about um, how I'm going to approach certain things. It's just at the end, how does I want, how do I want it to feel? And, you know, feel is everything because the feel is what you gravitate to and want to kind of keep listening to over and over because you like the direction in the feel. And I think with um, R&B, you know, 
you wanna you wanna just have people always want to listen to it and it be attractive to the air. So if somebody else, you know, walk by and they hear it and they go, yo, what's that? You know, because that's what I think that project is going to do for a long time is people going to hear it and they're going to ask somebody, well, what's that? And when they ask them what's that, then they're going to play it and then, you know, they're going to play it for somebody and they're going to play it for somebody and it's going to kind of keep traveling on for, for quite some time, I think. Yeah. And then ending it with the the medley, where did that come from and why did you end up sequencing it that way? Well, a medley was was kind of kind of an idea I seen Cool V do, right? But his mix ain't as accurate as, as what I did, so it ain't the same exact thing he did. But years ago he had a he had a mix that was, was dope. But the difference was with what I was doing, I was able to take more Jackson parts from different songs and increase. So you got like four different songs in one song. And then uh, the arrangement was just, that was a lot of work. Like, so it wasn't taking a two track and putting drums to a two track. That was more, I w at the end of the day, I was dealing with maybe 40 something tracks at the end of the day. So to sequence that and send it to an engineer to mix, just the, the mix pattern alone, because you got to make sure every single transition, you know, makes sense. Gotcha. And, and with that, too, I think it's interesting because throughout your career, the progression that you've had, like doing arrangement and doing mixing and doing production and all the different things, DJing, of course, et cetera. How, how have you found the different skills that you have overlap versus do they ever compete? Like you look at some more as a mixer versus a, you know, a producer, or does that ever factor into things? I always look at it from a producer standpoint, you know, I mean, being a DJ plays a part because you, you have knowledge if you look behind me to have knowledge of a lot of these records and to at one time listen to every single record you see behind me, my knowledge of records and the ideas that I got because I could hear something and um, I could think about one of them records. You know, I'm thinking about grooves. I'm always thinking about grooves and bass lines and different things. So even if... Um, if you told me if I was working with you and you told me you wanted a sound and I might ask you, well, what would you compare your sound to? And once you tell me, well, this record, this dude did this record. It's not like I'm gonna, it's not like I'm gonna copy the record that, that somebody did. It's more like I, I need to understand the, the, the elements and the ingredients in the record so I can get a, a full vision of what I'm going to do or what I'm going to present to you. Right. You know, so I'm a dude that deal with ingredients. I don't, I don't like to copy nothing. You know, I like to kind of, you know, think of something and, and go from scratch. Okay. So that leads me into uh, going back a ways with the funky technician. Uh, you were, credited at doing the arrangement with like Mike Smooth, Premier, and Shlomo. So what, what did you, what does that mean in that instance? I mean, with, with the Funky Technician, I had no production skills whatsoever. So that was really Diamond and Premier and Show and, and Mike, you know, helping putting all that together. You know, me just purely being an artist, me purely, you know, I had input of what I want to rhyme on, but from, from the other standpoint, it was just being purely an artist, not nothing to do with production at all. So what did it, uh, what did the arrangement, quote unquote, mean? Or what did you... The arrangement meaning, you know, how I structure the rhymes, what I might want for me to cut, you know, or what I might want Mike Smooth to cut, you know, so I kind of knew the hooks. And, you know, so arrangement in, in that point in, in the say I had. I had been told along the way that 
sometimes or all the time when you wrote or write that you would just write out the the end of the lines? Is that true? Nah, the way I write rhymes is I don't write rhymes straight out the conventional way how other rappers write rhymes. I write rhymes based on compounds and compounds and punchlines. That's what I do. That's how I do it. So if you look at a piece of paper, you'll just see words. You won't you won't understand what the words mean because I'm going to fill in the blank. So you might say auditioning for broads, listening to frauds, you know, get down with the Lord, you know, shit's retarded, sister's closet. You might just see words. You won't have a clue of how I'm going to attach those words. So when I, when it's time for me to write it out, based on the concept or based on the song, I, I put the filling in, you know? So when you're tired of listening to frauds, auditioning for broads, my shit religion, you need to get up on the Lord. Because nowadays, man, shit's retarded. When it's cool to wear shit out your sister's closet. You know, now I'm, I'm making it, I'm making it something now. I'm putting the words in between. That's going to, you know, attach everything. It's going to be the glue. Okay. And then do you, did any of that carry over to beat making for you? No, nah, not being an artist. Where, where the beat making came in is that was always being around show. And show had a, a 1200 and a 950. And I used to watch him tap on the machine. And, you know, I watch I'm I'm a very sharp observer. If, if I watch you do something long enough and I get the knowledge, if I get the understanding behind what you're doing, I can do what you do, you know? And that came with production. And that definitely came with DJing. Like I would watch DJs do what they do. And then I would, you know, if they got off the turntables, I'd get on behind them and kind of mimic what they was doing, getting an understanding. So um, I always thought it was interesting, the progression of your career in the sense that at least a lot of the people I knew, they would start off rapping and then go, I mean, they would start off doing something else and end up being a, or they would start as a producer and, and then maybe own a label or maybe do something else. But starting as a rapper, moving into production while, right. while maintaining rapping, of course, what made that something you were comfortable or you really wanted to like dedicate a lot of time to? Nah, I don't, I don't think I'm ever comfortable because when I'm working on one, it takes away from the other two. So you ever heard the, you heard the, the story like, um, I'm a jack of all trades, a master of none, you know? So I'm not just doing one thing. So it's hard for me to master one thing when I'm doing three things. And when I work on one or the other, it's going to always take away from the other two. So they're never, it's hard to get them, it's hard to get three wheels spinning at the same speed all the time. If I turn, swipe one wheel, that'll spin. If I try to swipe the other two wheels, this one is going to eventually slow down. So if I'm constantly focused on one wheel and I'm spinning that one wheel, then that one wheel is going to spin the fastest. But when I'm trying to juggle all three, it's too complicated. Okay. Well, then, um, moving with the going into the return of the Funky Man, then, you obviously switched labels from Wild Pitch to Giant, and then you got with uh, Rhyme Syndicate as well. What did you notice was different or you learned or saw differently working with the uh, Rhyme Syndicate? Well, the Rhyme Syndicate thing didn't pan out how I wanted it to pan out. That's what people don't understand. It did and it didn't. It, it worked because I evolved into something else. I evolved into a, I evolved into a producer. But my goal was when Ice-T signed me, I needed his mentorship. Ice-T had a, he has an incredible vision. Ice-T is a pure hustler, you know? So he understood when he was signing me, the vision he had for me, that could, he could translate to the label and they would listen to him because he's Ice-T, you know? So what wound up happening is when I got signed to, 
to Giant Warner Brothers, I started doing movies. He was doing New Jack City, did Ricochet. He did the rock band, Body Count. So the tutelage I needed, the mentorship, I couldn't get from him because he was doing the other things. And I think that kind of stagnated me because I was really relying on his mentorship to kind of shape my career because I was a a battle rapper, a street rapper, whatever you want to call it, that's what I was. Pure skills to the fullest, but I needed somebody to help guide me and mold me to create the records that I know I was capable of creating, but really didn't have the long view vision. I had a short vision. In, so, in what way did you have, what do you mean a short vision? I think when you coming from the hood and, um, your goals are short, right? Because when you come from the projects, you raise with one parent or you raise by your grandmother or, or however it is, and you struggle, you grow up struggling in life, you have a short vision because when you finally get your hands on some money, you're trying to buy the things that you wish you had as a kid. You're not thinking far, you're not thinking house, you're not thinking long range thinking short goals i never had that coat get that coat oh shit i'm gonna get them sneakers no shit i never went to that restaurant i'm gonna eat there for the whole week shit like that is short vision and i don't blame artists that have short visions because we're from the struggle you know i mean people that have you know generational wealth and they have families that you know, they get that shit out their system in their 20s. Right. People who grow up the projects and, and go through a lot of struggles, we don't get, we don't start getting right until the 30s and 40s. Don't, because you don't have no blueprint in front of you to follow. you learning everything by trial and error. Right. So I think I learned a lot of stuff trial and error. And then even with my goals, and, you know, my short goals, you know, they came so quick, whatever I wanted. All right, I got money. All right, I got some jewelry. All right, everything I wanted, I got so quick that it was like, I don't even know what I want now, you know. And it, it just became me, you know, living through my grandmother, you know, making sure she had everything. So to make her happy was like my ultimate goal after a certain period. And then when she passed away, I lost vision again because I ain't know, you know, now, you know, Elle is guiding me. Elle is around me a lot, knowing I just lost my grandmoms and he's telling me I can't quit. And, you know, I'm vibing off of Elle energy. So now when it comes to music, you know, I'm around Elle and his energy is what's motivating me. And then when he got killed, then it was just like, ah, oh, fuck this shit, you know? Right. And that's when you ain't really hear me rapping as much. You hear me sporadically. Right. Because, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as fun anymore. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, um, taking it back a little bit, one thing I was always curious about, though, especially on the mentorship side, since you brought up Ice-T and not getting that in the way you hoped or wanted it, was – with Jazzy J, especially on that album, doing a lot of the engineering and uh, Return of the Funky Man album mm -hmm. in particular, but with him, you know, being a pioneer, having success with Busy B and all the different things that he did, mm -hmm. what, if anything, did you pick up from him or notice from him? Well, um, Jay is a, a, he's a real key figure in my life. You know, Jay, used to DJ in a club called Dance Ateria, and Jay would sneak me in that club when I was only 14, 15 years old, and he would get me in that club. So before him even, before I even had a deal, Jay was a, a influence in my life that people don't really understand or know. So when I finally did get the return of the Funky Man, I wanted to record with Jay. I went and sought out Jay, you know? And, and... It came out, it came out, it was what it was, you know? But to this day, I tell Premier all the time, I regret, because 
everything was happening so fast. I'm like, I should have just snatched Premiere up and have Premiere kind of produce most of the album. Because like I said, I was expecting Ice to be around. And when Ice wasn't around, I should have immediately just went back to the original formula with Premiere and, and my team and just kept it like that. Right. Well, do you, um, on the one hand, I can understand and I can see that, but I would also imagine, and I want to ask you, like, that to me also, though, I think laid the foundation for what you were going to do as a producer, even though it didn't. Yeah, because even though the album may not have sold as much or maybe you weren't as happy with it on the same time, it showed you could produce and you could produce the other members of DITC. Well, but that, that comes in trial and error. That comes with, you know, Ice ain't around and... Who knows if Ice was around and he mentored me, I might have never been a producer. That's true. It's because of him not being around and finding something else to do that I wanted to challenge myself doing that made me become a producer. Now, if I was around Ice and Ice, I was doing the records, I'd have probably been a pure, straight, cold-blooded rapper, you know, cold-blooded MC where I say cold-blooded because if my focus was just on rapping, I'd have probably been very dangerous, you know? I mean, I'm dangerous, but... I was about to say, I would argue when, you still are. <laughs> when, when you only have one thing to go on, you're going to master that one thing. If you don't do beats, if you don't DJ, and what you do is rhyme, all you got is time to perfect your rhyme. That's all you got time for Cause you don't do nothing else. Right. But I think when um you do production and you DJ, you know, I think um you got a lot to do, you know? And your time, I do songs when I feel like doing songs. For me to do an album or do something, man, I have to have a vision. I don't want to just rhyme because I can rhyme, you know? That don't make no sense, you know? You should have a vision. You should have a vision for your project or what you're planning to do. Right. Now, I know you produced the majority of Return of the Funky Man, but, of course, Showbiz and Diamond D were on there as well. Mm -hmm. And they obviously are excellent producers as well. So at that point, since you had worked with them, with Return uh, with Funky Technician as well, did you, like, what were you seeing from them that was different by the time you got to the second album, because of course they were also, you know, growing and progressing as well. Well, I think um, with Show, Show always had beats. Diamond always had beats. I think, um, though, that was my team, you know? So that's who I wanted to, um, you know, help me craft my project. So it wasn't, that I seen something directly Pacific. It was just like, this is part of the formula, you know? So, you know, I'm going to go with the formula. Okay. And then even though uh, Ice-T wasn't there, I know you had uh, DJ Aladdin did work with you at least a little bit on the album. And he's one of the best DJs I've ever seen in person in my life, uh, as far as his skills on the turntables. So right. did you um, notice anything different coming with his mentality versus more the New York side of things? Well, um, I picked up things from Aladdin on the DJ. You got to understand why I'm the way I am on the turntables. Premier, Aladdin, um, Premier, Aladdin, DJ Muggs, when he was with 783. Right. You know, show, show was an incredible DJ, you know, so I'm picking up all these things from those DJs, you know, so with, um, when you saying, um, now I lost the train of my thought, or what you asked me. Oh, I was what just saying, you, what did Aladdin kind oh, of... Oh, Aladdin just had a different flair, him and SLJ, you know, who's, uh, what they call SLJ now. But uh, he's a part of the Cy Ra Collective. So if you're familiar with the yep. Cy Ra, I think they work with Erica Badu at some point or 
you know, um, on my SLJ, early SLJ, that's who I was working with. Right. Okay. Because he, um, I just never forget one time in L.A., I saw him literally jump over the turntables and switch his mm -hmm. hands and keep going the same and didn't miss a beat or anything. And I'd never not seen that. Latin, Latin was a problem. And then you can't forget how I not for how do I forget Rock Raider? I was around Rock Raider. Right. And Rock Raider was one of the greatest dudes ever, you know? With production you're growing, but then you also mixed a lot of the records on there as well. So how did you fall into or end up doing mixing as well on Return of the Funky Man? Well, with Return of the Funky Man is just me being there and, you know, sometimes the producers wasn't there. And a lot of times I was just um, doing doing the songs, right? And when I was doing the songs and it was there, I, they wasn't there. I wanted a certain mix. I wanted it to instruct it a certain way. So that's how I kind of got into mixing. Okay. And then, uh, of course, I would say one of the next... Uh, big things you did was the suicidal thoughts. So with that record, and also we mentioned a message earlier, it was interesting that those two records are huge, okay. but they're also the last, last couple, songs. Albums. Yeah, so what, why do you think that they worked being the last songs? I don't, I don't try to ask me about that. I wouldn't know, I didn't know they was gonna be the last song shit. I was just impressed that they were songs on albums, you know, of those magnitudes. You could have placed that the third, fourth, fifth. You could put that in there. Interlude, I didn't care where you put it. I just was happy to be a part of such massive projects, massive albums. Right. Okay. And then with Suicidal Thoughts, that was, I would argue, probably Scarface at the time was one of the few people to really examine that type of thing. And then obviously Biggie did it extremely well on that song. Right. But when, what have you found as a producer and even as a writer artist yourself, when people explore things that aren't as common and do it in such a powerful way, what extra stuff does that add you think to the, to the song or to the music? Um, I think when you come in as a producer, you 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 look at it from a different angle. You're not a beat maker, you know? So I think as a producer, you get to sit with the artist and you get to create magic with the artist. You know, you sit there and you try to start something from scratch. I mean, like, I, like my my favorite analogy is that I'm a tailor, right? So me being a tailor, you might want me to craft your suit to go to an event. Sure, I got some suits in the closets, meaning I probably did some beats. Yeah, and if you found one of those beats and it was the perfect fit, you think this is the suit you want, then hey, go for it. But if you're patient, you know, I got some fabric in the back, you know, and I can kind of size you up and find the right fabric for this event the right look. So now when you go to this event, you wear something that you know that nobody else got because it was crafted just for you. Same thing with being a producer. You want to craft something exactly for the artist you're working with. You know, beat makers are the type that just give you a CD and say, these my beats, rhyme on them. And they don't really sit there with you. I don't come up with the magic. It's just so really the, the artist is still a producer because he still got to produce the song. He just gave him the beat. He wasn't there to really sequence it or do something. He might come to mix it, but to produce is just to be hand in hand with the, with the um, artist, you know? So how did the phone call stuff come up with for Suicidal Thoughts? Well, I got to lay the beat and Big was there when I laid it. You know, but then him and him and Puff, they started working on it when I was in the round. So Big kind of crafted it the way he wanted to craft it, you know. And I wasn't mad with the way it was crafted, but a part of me felt that um, 
a part of me felt that I could have mixed it. It, it could have sounded a little better because as a producer, you know the elements in your music and why they there. Somebody else that's touching your music don't know why certain elements are there. You know, for instance, people know I was using sleigh bells, but I was using them mixed and blended with the hi-hat for a certain sound, you know, for a certain feel. Now, if you somebody that don't know why them sleigh bells there, you might have my shit sound like Christmas. And it's just all high and bright like Santa coming. And it's like, I'm looking like, yo, I ain't, I ain't want that shit that loud, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so since you had uh, been working and been out for several years at that point, what no did you notice any big difference by how you were received once the song came out? Yeah, I think I got work. I think um, my biggest regret was in, I had so much going on. Like I said, when you're an artist and you're a producer and besides that and a DJ and your personal life, you can be distracted if, if you're not really focused. And I think I lost focus. Mm. What a lot going on was like 93, 94, where I was being just pulled all over the place. So I don't think, you know, a lot of my focus was at the strongest at that point. You know, I started to get back on track when I started working on The Awakening. The Awakening was something that I just, that was like my baby pet project from the interludes to everything about that project, that vision. I wanted it to be melodic. I, I wanted it a lot of things that I wanted that did come off the way I wanted. I think the awakening was the best project I've done because it I, I really was hands-on, not with just the music, but I was hands-on also with the videos. So when I got tired of my fucking director saying, hey, we got a vision, and then they do the video and that shit don't look nothing don't feel like nothing what your song is about. And you're like, yo, this shit, why well, you got me doing here? And, I, and you know, so it was taking charge with the awakening, knowing that when I did Hip to the Game, I wanted the video to look fun. I wanted it to feel good. I wanted it to be summertime. I know when I did the actual facts video, I know I wanted a, a jazz type feel, a club setting. I know I wanted different rappers on different instruments, you know, great, great artists and friends of mine to be all in the video. But it just looks like if you was looking at the video, I always want you to look like that. Like, damn, I want to be there. That looked like that shit was popping, you know, because that's what I got when I used to look at cold chilling videos, you know, with Kane ain't no half stepping. When Molly did the symphony and they shot the that that video was dope. When when all the like a lot of the biz videos is always dope, from the vapors to uh, yeah. you know, it always looked fun. And the the video helped you get an understanding and a feel of the record. Well, you know, when you get a director to shoot your your video. And that vision don't look like nothing to have to do with your record, then it kind of confused people because here your record is doing one thing and then you got your video doing something else. So I think as an artist, it's, it's very important for you to have a vision for your songs, you know, because when I do songs now, it's like when I look at it, it's like, why am I doing this song? What do I wish to obtain doing this song? Uh, is this going to be an anthem? Is this going to be a call response record? You know, does this record have the energy? What do I expect the people to do when I'm performing it? How do how are they supposed to feel when I perform it? It's more like a vision to what I'm doing versus just I can rhyme over any beat and I'm just going to rhyme like, nah, I think when you have a purpose and people understand your purpose, the fans get a, a real, a more in-depth feel about who you are. So that, that being said, what, uh, one of my favorite songs on The Awakening is the one with Karis One. So what did you, uh, 
what was the vision of getting him on the album and putting him over to that beat in particular? I mean, because KRS One was, you know, KRS One was the teacher, you know, and at the time, gimmicks played such a huge part because, you know, labels wanted, they was really pumping money behind gimmicks. And, you know, I'm like, damn, shit is a gimmick. Like, you know, so I want to make a record called No Gimmicks. And, you know, so that's that's what we wound up doing. Well, speaking, speaking of labels, that was your third album and your third label. So why... Why were you, why did you find yourself at a different label uh, each time you were putting out an album? Okay. Well, with Wild Pitch, I want, I signed a Wild Pitch because I wanted to be in a seminar. In order to be in a seminar, you had to be signed to a label. So, you know, when you I new wanted to, the new music yeah, I wanted the new music seminar. I wanted to be showcases the up and coming dude. Like I wanted to go against the industry's best. I want to know that I match up equally with anybody you compare me with in the industry. And that was my goal. Because, you know, people say this one is nice, that one is nice. And it's like, all right, you know, I'm going to show you I'm nicer than all of them, you know. So that was my purpose with Funky Technician. <clears throat> Return of Funky Man is um, Ice-T took me, even though he wasn't there, he definitely brought me to a situation that I was well off financially than I ever was with Wild Pitch. But now I'm learning just because a label got money and they spend the money on you doesn't mean that's always going to be a great thing, especially when you're dealing with such a huge label. You could get lost in the sauce easily. You know, so many labels would sign artists that they didn't know how to market and promote. And it was like a gun you didn't know how to shoot. So since you don't know how to shoot the gun, you shelf the gun. The gun might be the most highly technical gun ever, but you don't know how to shoot it, so you shelf it. And I think when Ice got um, into his movie thing, he wasn't there to speak on the behalf of me. So I think Ice being a part of the equation probably would have gave me more life and maybe a second album on, on one. Who knows? But, you know, because Ice is the one that brought me to them and told them, you need to sign this dude. This is my artist. So when a art, when a um, person like Ice brings you to a label and they know how big he is and he's supposed to mentor this artist, you know, they feel good because we get two for one. We don't have to ask Ice to do certain things because that's Ice artist. You know, so, but when he's not around, it's like, well, he's not around anyway, so we might as well drop him, you know, and they wound up dropping me. Now, dealing with Neil was a whole different thing. Neil Levine, you know, the president of Penalty, was the first higher up person that ever just said, he ain't need no hand on. Oh, this, this dude is available? Fuck it. I need him on my label. And that's how it was. And I came there and he always told me, look, I'm not going to try to change who you, who you are. You be you and we'll find a way to market and promote you the way you are. And that was the first time I ever heard that from a label, which, you know, and he let me do my own videos and he had a promotion company. So he knew how to market and promote me. Yeah, I know he... Uh did and said similar things to Capone and Noriega, so that obviously helped them a lot um, throughout their careers. So, and that that was, um, you know, a great, in my opinion, a great album. And I like the fact that it, to your point, it seemed like that one, you were more relaxed even, like when I would listen to the songs, whereas Return of the Funky Man, especially compared to Funky Technician, it seemed like it wasn't as, natural maybe at times uh, yeah well, we're, we're, we're turning a funky man not having a mentor and with so much going on uh, a lot of times i was going in the studio knock the song out and worrying who's what what club is popping is it powerhouse tonight whether well, it's the red zone 
you know, what, what's going on tonight, you know? So I would go in there and my focus wasn't as dedicated as Funky Technician or Awakening. The second album was like, it was, it was still dope, but the, the focus wasn't as pivotal as the first or, or the Awakening. One of the, the projects that I think is a, one of the most slept on albums ever that I know you did a lot of work on is The Foundation by Brand Nubian. And yeah. that was one of my favorite albums of 98. So before we get into the songs that you actually did, um, the thing I thought was interesting about you working with them at that point in your career is that, you know, you were there learning and, and growing with Digging in the Crates and all that. And Brand Nubian, obviously, with Diamond D had the affiliation there. But right. by, by the time you got to Brand Nubian, they had been out for a long time. They, the reunion, all these different things that were going on that impacted the making of that album. So was it very different for you to get in as a producer with the established group that's going through a union compared to working in the same circle with the same dudes you've been came in the game with? Nah, it wasn't hard at all, you know? Okay. I mean, Puba is, is like my brother. Puba is like, we hang out, we talk and chop it up all the time. So when you have a relationship with artists, it's no real pressure, you know, as if, you know, I had to work with you and I really don't know you like that. And I don't know your way of thinking and what you want, then the pressure is there. I'm with Puba all the time. I know Puba inside out, upside down, especially when it comes to music. So it's just doing something and telling him, yo, what you think of this? Yo, check this out. And, and kind of giving him a vibe of what, why I'm submitting this and what I see by submitting. Okay. And then that was one of, in my opinion, the first kind of wave of a reunion album that actually was arguably as good as some of the music in their prime. So um, given that they did have whatever feelings toward each other at different times, how do you think they as a group and you as a producer were able to help them get past all that to make such a high quality album? Well, for me, it's not really getting them to come to terms. They got to come to terms before I'm even aboard, you know, because in order for them to even get a situation, they have to come to terms and they got to situate everything and square everything off. So, you know, once they got the situation and they let bygones or whatever be bygones, then it was just like, yo, we're working on this project, yo, Ness, I know you got some heat. And then we, we wound up working. I mean, one of my favorite records, I think, is a slept on record, is Love Vs. Hate. You know, Love Vs. The, the, the energy of that record was incredible. And it was, it was, when I, when I found that, I was, ooh, this is, this is this is it right here, you know? And was that one of those where you, they're the only ones you ever played it for and it was done? They wanted it immediately? Yeah, yeah. That was one of those that it was done just for them. Okay. And then um, as you've seen, you know, up to that point, I think they were, you know, they never had a gold record or got super, super big or whatever. But I also, I always thought the three of them in particular had very different but very insightful ways of commenting on what was going on in the rap world and society right. and in our country. So with the foundation, like, overall, and even with, like, You For Me and Straight Out Now Rule, like, what mm -hmm. made it, like, special for you that those made it on the album? Oh, man, because I, I was sitting with them. So a lot of the records that I was doing, they were there to, to watch me. I mean, a record I made right there in front of them, it didn't make the album, but if you Google it, you could probably find it. It was called Scientists of Sound. That record was dope, man. And I thought it was going to make the project. It didn't, but I made that for them in front, right in front of them. I mean, it's the same thing with Channel 10. When I did Channel 10 for Capone and Noriega, they'll tell you I made the beat in front of them. You know, so 
I'm I'm like that. If if I feel I got some ideas and you got the rhymes and you got whatever and we need to knock it out, man, I might fly a musician or two in. We're gonna get it right. We gonna definitely get it right. I'm going I'm going I'm going to find the I'm going to find the right the right music for you. Okay. And then how does all this compare with the message? Well, the message was my song. And um it was already it was already configured. The chorus, everything about that song was configured already. I mean, that was a record that was like add water and mix, you know? You know, because Dre added the strings, but everything else was there. Gotcha. Even the hook. Even the hook. Yeah. It's uh it's interesting because one of the things that ties nicely into the Motown state of mind is that as I was looking at all the things, knowing I was going to be talking to you, all the different sounds, the different eras, the different types of artists and the versatility you have is something that I've always been very impressed with, especially as your career continues and continues going strong. So, um, you know, I think that's a great thing. And I also think it, uh, as you've progressed, how have you found that you're able to find similar and different ways to push yourself over the years? Because, um, you know, and I tell the story a lot. I was, one of my mentors was talking to somebody else, right? And he asked the dude, like, why? Why haven't you did any new projects? Why won't you do some new music? He's telling this artist, you know, artist was like, ah, people ain't checking for me. I have bad scenarios. They call me the old head and blah, blah, blah. And I said, um, wow. He said, what did music ever do wrong to you? And he was like, what you mean? He said, well, what did music ever do wrong to you? He said, because I hear everything you're saying, but why are you taking all that out on the music? And that kind of struck a chord because it was just like, it was time where I was in that position. And, you know, music ain't never do nothing wrong to me. So you can't, you could go through things, but you shouldn't take it out on the music. And uh, I had kind of rediscovered love for the music again and wanted to make it and wanted to make it um and kind of wanted to uh make it fun again gotcha so then now with the success of motown state of mind what what do you got coming up uh i got a project called next level nostalgia and with Next Level Nostalgia, um, that's a that's a redo of kind of the awakening, knowing that I, I don't have a provision that would stop me from re-recording songs and making me the complete owner of that master. So um, I done started re-recording. I already recorded like four or five songs. And I'm going to add new songs and new interludes and new music and I'm working with Knox, I'm working with Jake Warren, I'm working with Tall Black Guy. And that music is called Next Level Nostalgia. It's because I'm going back to using 1200 and the 950. Even though you got all this technology out, I want to go back to these analog machines and create, you know, the magic. Man, well, that's, that's incredible, Lord Finesse. I appreciate you uh, coming through here to Unique Access and uh, looking forward to sitting down with you again, man. I appreciate it. Ah, oh, man, thanks for having me.